Well, kia ora, good morning, everybody. Good to see you all here. Um, well, as you know, we've been beginning this uh, series looking at offences. And a few people during the week have said to me, hey, Craig, it's really timely that we should look at the subject. And I said, hey, any time is timely to talk about offences. Uh, world history is built around offences and uh, how it is that people have taken offence and then responded to it. Last week, we got a look at uh, Genesis, the book of Genesis, and, and a great story there about being offended when uh, Joseph, who was the favourite son of his father, Jacob, uh, ended up, by virtue of being the favourite son, lost favour with his brothers, and his brothers sold him into slavery and allowed him to uh, then become not only uh, a person who ended up in jail, but ultimately promoted by God to be the Prime Minister of Egypt. And then this amazing thing happens right at the very end of that story, when um, uh, Joseph's brothers appear to Joseph, uh, worn out, hungry, desperate. And uh, Joseph looked at them and felt pity for them and said to them, hey, listen, at the end of the day, it wasn't you guys who sold me into slavery out of your envy for me. It was actually God who promoted me. It was God who led me to Egypt so that I could be here for such a time as this to help you. And we see the incredible grace there when there was a huge amount of room to be offended. And so this morning, we're going to press into uh, another story. Uh, we're going to sort of sit around King David's life for a while over the next few weeks because uh, his life is full of responses to offense. And so as we do that, we're going to uh, see ourselves because that's what scripture does. We see ourselves and we're going to learn from his experience. So let me pray as we open up. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that in there we find uh, truths that are true today as they were back when the stories were first written. And we find ourselves looking in a mirror, and that's frightening, but yet it's the work of your spirit doing that for us. And so we just want to pray, Lord, that you would open up the eyes of our understanding today, that we would find not only a story that is old, but a story that is new because it helps us see ourselves. So we ask that you would do that for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you know, there's a lot of things in the uh, in the media about offences and uh, memes, and I, I happened to find this. I thought, you've got to laugh at this one. A new device for people who get offended quite easily. And um, this is this this could be marketed. I, I, I um, obviously, um, yeah. But hey, I won't stop there because somebody might get offended by it. So we'll just move on. The thing about offences is that. Um, there are lots of reasons that we find to be offended. That's just human nature. We sort of have this broken uh, spirit about us, which we can't always overcome. And there are things that will offend us. And sometimes we're quite surprised by how it is that we get offended. But one of the things that surprises us sometimes is the success of others. We get offended by the success of others. And Craig, what are you talking about here? Why would we be surprised about the success of others? Well, it's when your brother or your sister or some relative lands on their feet and they turn up to the Christmas function in that brand new car with their $500 leather shoes and they're sort of like, hey, check it out. Who's winning the game? You know, who's winning the game? And, and, and you can look at that and you go, hmm, yeah, I'm sure you're not paying your taxes. Hmm, yeah, sure. I'm sure you suck it up to the boss. Yeah, I'm sure you just won a lotto and didn't tell us. You know, and so it's very easy out of envy and jealousy to be offended. Yeah, one of the things about being offended is that when we see offense, we should also look to see where the opposite of being offended is demonstrated. That's collegiality and celebration. And uh, I've got to say, I, I look at uh, the Commonwealth Games in the last few weeks it's been on, and I really think the cyclists have got this sorted. You know, a team of cyclists at a road race have already worked out before the race Who's going to get the medal? You like that? Now, my cousin was a professional road cyclist, was in three Olympic Games for New Zealand, and uh, <clears throat> he, he was always trying to describe this to me because I just thought, like a road race is every man or every woman for themselves. It's just like, you know, get in behind somebody, uh, suck all their energy out, you know, let them break, be the one who breaks the, the wind, as, as it were, you know, and then in the last minute, you just go for it. I thought that's how you won a race, but no, no. Now, it works this way. The team will break the, the, uh, the wind. Be careful what I'm saying here. Break wind. And, um, and you follow in behind. 
and then in the last couple of kilometers, you should have more energy in your legs than the rest of them, and you're the one who's been appointed to take it in the last moment. And so as a team, one guy gets the medal and the others get the, the joy of celebrating that they help that guy get across the line. And I think that's pretty awesome, really, isn't it? There's a fable or a story about a, an eagle, and uh, he was really disappointed that he couldn't fly as high as other eagles. And so one day, out of frustration, he went to the local archer, the guy, the guy who owns the bows and arrows, and he said, look, um, for, a, for a certain amount of money, I want you to shoot that guy out of the sky. And, the, and the, uh, the archer says, well, look, I'd like to do that, but I need a special arrow with special feathers on it so that it would go that high. Have you got it? And he says, yeah, I have. Here's one. And so lines it up, but the arrow falls short. And uh, he says, let's try again. Here's a go. Here's another one. Anyway, this carried on all day until finally uh, the archer says, I'm not going to be able to get it. Obviously, that eagle flies too high. And, uh, and with that, the eagle who had been trying to get the archer to kill him said, well, you know, I've run out of feathers too and, and flew away but promptly fell off the cliff and died. You see, the thing is that in our hope of taking somebody else out, we often destroy ourselves. And that is where offences become something that end up affecting you. You know, the person who offends you, they live rent-free in your head forever sometimes. They live rent-free in your head. And that's not a pretty sight for you. So today we're going to have a look at um, David, the young David, before he became king. And when he was anointed to be the king by the prophet Samuel, uh, a king was already in place, King Saul. And uh, Saul was anointed to be king. He was the first king of Israel. And by being so, uh, he had a lot of privileges, but he also had a lot of responsibilities. The problem was that Saul was impetuous. That meant that he always assumed upon himself to be the person who would fix everything. And one particular event, uh, the prophet Samuel said, look, before you go to battle, I'm going to join you and the army, and we're going to have a worship service. We're going to make an offering before God, and, uh, and that is going to get things right with God, and then you'll be able to go into battle. Well, Samuel was late. He was late getting there, okay? And uh, Saul was impetuous. He was frustrated and impatient. And he goes, well, I'll do this. I'll do the offering. And so he stepped into a priestly role, which wasn't his role, and he did this offering. And when finally Samuel turned up, he was absolutely livid. And he saw that in this guy, Saul, whilst you might be king, you were still working or operating outside of your lane. And he knew that this king wasn't going to be a good king. So in the fullness of time, not too much longer, uh, what happened is Samuel went off and found somebody else who would be the future king. Saul was still the king, but he knew that he wasn't going to last because he just didn't have the right character. And so he goes off to Bethlehem, great place, and he finds the household of Jesse. And there he looks at all Jesse's sons and he goes, uh, Jesse, one of your boys, God wants to be the future king. And he looks at all these fine young gentlemen and they're sort of posing. Am I the one? And uh, he looks, no, no, no. And he says, you must have another son. You must have someone somewhere. Go, oh, yeah, we've got the little fella, David. He's out looking after the sheep. He says, well, look, I'm just going to stay here. You go get him. And they bring him in. And he says, you're the one. You're the one. And so he anoints him to be the king, prays for him, this little shepherd boy. And, uh, and again, the story continues to grow. And we find that uh, uh, David goes off to the front lines of the battle to find what his brothers are up to when they're fighting the Philistines. They seem to do that every spring, fight the Philistines. What are you doing this year, fighting the Philistines? You know, um, you know you normally you find the Tapuna Rugby Club play, plays Rangata or United Pirates, Eastern Districts in the Mount. This is sort of how it went, you know, but we're going to fight the Philistines. And here they were. But this time they had Goliath, and he was a monster literally. And they were all too scared of him. But young David, he turns up and he goes, I'll take him out. I'll sort him out. And he does. We know the story. One of the first stories we ever hear when we go to Sunday school, isn't it? David and Goliath. Great story. And, um, and what happens here is that David wins not only that battle, but he wins the heart of the people. This little guy, courageous, goes out there, smacks this giant in the head with a stone, falls over, chops his head off. It's sort of a great way to uh, draw attention to your Facebook. Uh, okay, plenty of hits there. Trending Goliath's head, you know. Uh, and so here we go. 
So what happens is um, now the trouble begins. We think it should be a victory, but the trouble begins. It says here, when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, Goliath, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Mm. Now, he literally only slayed one, but you get the idea, you see. Saul was very angry with this refrain. Disple- this, this refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. Now, I like those final words. It gives you an idea of how this guy was uh, obsessed with David. He was like, he's keeping a close eye on you, you know? Sorry, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and this, is, this is the thing. He becomes obsessed, preoccupied, overwhelmed by the success of this guy. And, um, and for David, he was sort of innocent, really. He didn't realize that just by being successful at what he did um, was going to cause so much grief. He was really on God's fast track to kingship. He had sort of won the, uh, the university scholarship and was being, you know, promoted and celebrated and everything he did turned to success. So God was with him and God was not with Saul any longer. Uh, the painter Rembrandt has a couple of paintings about this occasion of Saul and David. And this one here is particularly powerful. Uh, what we've got here is this picture of Saul looking really depressed. And the suggestion is that he is depressed. He's depressed by the fact that he is not the best at everything. And that's one of the problems that people have. They want to be the best of everything. And so you've got Saul there with his royal robes on and hiding behind this curtain, feeling sorry for himself. And David here, as we've read in Scripture, would play the harp and he would soothe him. He would soothe him with his anointed uh, playing and possibly singing. But you see in this painting there that uh, Saul has his hands placed very accurately on that spear. His hand isn't relaxed, is it? It's like it's just really ready to to pick it up, pick up the spear. And David, whilst he's not looking at the king, is doing everything he can to look at the king. Not looking at the king in the eye, but certainly looking at that hand, isn't he? He's looking at that hand that's really just to, well, we know what happens. What happens is this, is that he says here, it says, the next day an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul and he was prophesying in his house while David was playing the lyre, the harp, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand And he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Now, where's uh, my helpful helpful assistant? Uh, Clint? Yeah, we're going to have some more artwork. Last week we did artwork. Uh, This is a repeat, really. Thanks, bro. Um, Hopefully we can see this. I get back here. I think we might stick it up on the screen on the side there if we can, uh, because it's so good. It needs to be celebrated. Um, (laughs) So I did this last week, and um, I talked about how our emotions um, and our offences, when we're offended, we have to take responsibility for the offence, okay? Did you hear what I said? We've got to take responsibility for our emotions when we're offended. But what happens is we can be, do, we can do one of two things. We can, we can, we can blow up. Boom. I'm offended. Yeah? You should never have done that to me. You should never have said that. You should never have been that. You shouldn't have breathed. You shouldn't have been born. I hate your guts. Boom. We're blowing up. Or the other thing we do is um, we go silent. Yeah? Why are you quiet? I'm not quiet. What's the problem? There's no problem. Well, how come you're quiet? Well, I want to be quiet. Well, what's the problem? There's no problem. Okay, now I know there's a problem. (laughs) But let me tell you this. The worst case scenario is a a King Saul story, isn't it? The worst case scenario is this, where somebody goes from here to here in about three and a half seconds. Yeah? 
That is dangerous, real dangerous. And this is what Saul was to David, dangerous. And so what we've got here in this guy, um, Saul, is somebody who's emotionally unstable. There is no doubt about it. He's emotionally unstable. And uh, I'm going to call him a spear chucker, a spear chucker. And there are spear chuckers all over the place. Spear chuckers are those who go from zero to, you know, and, and you're weary of it. After the first time it happens to you, you know, you walk around with your, uh, with your own eye on the person keeping the eye on you. And uh, one of the things we can do is uh, easily start chucking spears on social media uh, under our own name or even better, a pseudonym, a name, an anonymous name. And, uh, and the thing about this is that we live in a world where we can pour out our anger, pour out our vitriol, pour out our disappointment or our frustration or our small-mindedness. And let me tell you this, you know, some people give others a piece of their mind and they can't afford to give any of their mind away. They haven't got enough of their own, so don't go giving it away. The Psalm, Psalm 1 says this, Psalm 1 says this, and this is written for the 21st century. It says, blessed is the one who does not walk and step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, okay? Or uh, another, another um, version would say, sit in the seat of mockers. And when you are on your, uh, your keyboard, keyboard worrying away, you are sitting in the seat of mockers, okay? When you're knocking and bashing, thinking you're a hero by trying to call other people out in the comfort of your own home, uh, living this super boring life while other people are out there trying to do something, you think it's your responsibility to smash and bash. There's a lot of people who get a huge amount of pleasure out of ripping people apart on social media. That is not the way that we should live our lives. Um, social media is not a playground for your alter ego. It's not a playground for your alter ego. Seriously. Uh, the earlier part of this year, um, myself and the staff, um, without doing it formally, we all ended up listening to a podcast series called The, uh, the Downfall of Mars Hill. Big church in the States. Uh, Mark Driscoll was the senior pastor there and uh, a very, very influential ministry for about 10 years. And then the place became toxic because Mark just was overwhelmed with power and the authority that he felt uh, was his and the, res- and the respect uh, that he felt he was owed. And as they started to dismantle this church, when it all started to fall apart, um, one of the things that they were always conscious of was a blogger by the name of William Wallace II, okay, a pseudonym, William Wallace II. Uh, taken after the uh, the great liberator from Scotland who pushed back the British uh, nearly a thousand years ago. And uh, and as they were reading his blogs, of the blogs of William Wallace II, they were always mindful of how accurate his criticisms of the church were, criticisms of the staff were. And when it all fell apart, they found out that William Wallace II was none other than Mark Driscoll, the senior pastor. And here he was living this alter ego world, leading a church, and yet under the pseudonym of William Wallace II, he was beating up on his own church, telling people what they should and shouldn't be doing, and how, how, and, uh, in doing so, allowing his alter ego to have a trip, have a journey, have a, have a free reign on other people's uh, lives. So, he is getting back to, uh, to Saul, getting back to Saul. He says, as they danced, they sang. Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. When David is doing his thing, like David, as we know, is somebody who is just getting on with living his best life. David isn't the sort of guy who set himself up to be in a position where he was going to challenge the king. He just knew that he was on this slow track and probably a hard track to fulfill what God had put on his life. And that was ultimately being the king. And yet Saul was becoming, instead of his friend, instead of somebody who was going to help him, he was becoming his enemy. Now, in a perfect world with somebody who's emotionally stable, someone who lives in here when the offense happens, somebody who's emotionally stable, David should have had a visit from Saul, or at least somebody coming to Saul saying, the king wants to meet with you. He would like to know how it is that you strategize a battle. Because David 
develop the reputation of being able to lead the armies really well. And he always came back with great victories. Now, somebody who had a high level of emotional intelligence and confidence in himself should get alongside somebody else and say, hey, listen, you're doing really well. Do you think you could share that with the rest of the team? If you've got this innate ability to be able to uh, draw up a battle plan, why don't you tell the rest of us how that works? And there, Saul would have been drawing the best out of this young guy. See how that works? We shouldn't be intimidated by somebody else's success. We should invite them to, to lead up. And to invite someone to lead up is a gift for you, and it's a gift for the person who's leading up. You're building into their confidence. You're learning from their experience. They see the world from a different set of eyes. They see a world from a younger set of eyes. And so inviting them to lead up is going to invite them into your circle and allow you to benefit as the leader from the, from the experience or the innovation of your team. It doesn't always happen that way because, as we know, sometimes – not sometimes, often, the success of somebody coming through is a threat and it intimidates the existing leader. Here's this for a comment. It says this, that uh, your anger or sarcasm announces that you're offended. You're telling the world that you can't control your own emotions, so everyone else should do it for you. How do I control somebody else's emotions when they, when they fly off the handle really quickly? Well, I give them no responsibility. I just smile at them politely. I keep out of their way. Why? Because they're an angry person. And you can't control, if an angry person can't control themselves, you actually have to control their emotions for them. How? By keeping away largely. And that's what happens. So here we have, and the story continues, we have David who is now being pursued by somebody who struggles with the success of others. Saul is not going to give up on this guy. And so what happens is um, Saul decides that he's still um, angry at David for being so successful. And now that he's tried to kill him by throwing his spear at him, he's going to chase him into the desert, chase him into the wilderness to try to uh, overwhelm him. And so this particular story goes where there's 3,000 young men that Saul handpicked, 3,000 of them. And they chase David and this ragtag group of people who have uh, gathered around David. And they're in this valley called the Valley of Goats or the Valley of Engedi. And, uh, and they come, uh, the Saul's army come into this area and uh, it's an area they call the sheep pens, obviously a place where they bring the sheep back and, and, uh, and draft them out after being uh, up in the hills. And uh, in that moment, King Saul says, he's got to go to the toilet. Now, this is how earthy the Bible is. It's quite funny, really, if you look at it from that angle. But um, he goes into a cave to relieve himself, and who should be in the cave but David and his men? They're right at the back. And so, of course, the men are going to David. God has delivered your enemy right here. Look, you can see him. You can smell him. He's right here. I shouldn't have seen him. And, and, but what David does is um, David says, no, 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 we're not going to kill him. You know, imagine him at the back, you know, we're not going to kill him. Why not? Because we shouldn't kill him. Why not? He's the Lord's anointed. Okay. So David sneaks up and he cuts a piece of his cloak off him. Okay. While he's going about his business. And as he goes, then he goes, David walks out and he yells at Saul. He holds up this piece of cloak and, uh, and he starts to push back on Saul saying, Hey, listen, I haven't done you any harm. And this is what he says. He says, against whom has the king of Israel come out? Who are you pursuing? A dead dog? A flea? May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. Now Saul was overwhelmed by this emotionally. He was like, whoa, I just realized I was that far away from having my throat cut. When David had finished saying this, Saul asked, is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. And listen to this. He said, you are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I've treated you badly. You have just told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know 
that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. Okay. And so this is, this essentially, it looks like repentance, doesn't it? It looks like repentance. And, uh, and we would hope here in this story that it is repentance. But sadly, Saul's offendedness put him on the offensive and he just couldn't let it go. King Saul's offended ego left him unable to receive the truth. The truth being that he was on the way out and David was on the way out. And instead of saying, Hey, listen, you know, there's no success without succession. And I'm just going to, I see I've had my day. I had my chance. This is the new king. Instead of allowing him to learn from him and uh, grow from him, uh, he, he just pushed back in the hope that somehow in his twisted mind, that if he holds back on this new king who's arriving, somehow he would, he would live forever or, or have all this power and authority and, and, and his ego needs would be met. So the story goes on that uh, a little while later, a very similar scenario arises. 3,000 men chasing King David down the valley. And uh, David hears about where they're camped, and he doesn't run away. This time he goes towards them, and it's in the evening, and it's dusk, and all the, the men, 3,000 men and the king are camped out in the valley. And, um, and David says, I think we've got a plan. We've got a plan to prove to Saul that I'm not after him. And, uh, and this is how it goes. David then asked Ahimelech, the Hittite, and Abishai, son of Zeruiah, Job's brother, who will go down into the camp with me to Saul? I'll go with you, said Abishai. So David and Abishai went to the army by night, and there was Saul lying asleep under the camp, inside the camp, with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. Now, Abner was the, the ruler of David's army. He was the general. Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into our hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him, or his time will come and he will die, or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid what that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and water jug that are near his head and let's go. Now, the interesting thing here is that we see David once again being gracious, being gracious to, to Saul, a grace that he didn't deserve because in every sense of the word, it was a full-on battle, life for life was going on here. But David said, it's not for me to to touch this guy. It's not for me to kill this guy. And, and so Abishai is learning this huge lesson about honor for the king. But something else is going on here. Whether David knew it or not, I'm not sure. But what David is actually doing is he's telling Abishai and his whole army that this is how you actually treat a king. Yeah? This is how you treat a king. If this is truly God's anointed person, God's appointed person, then God will bring him in and God will take him out. You see what he said that, uh, he said some, he might go into battle and he might die. He might, he might get sick and he might die. Something will happen and he might die. He will die eventually. But, uh, David said, this is not me and not my responsibility to kill him. But I want to prove a point that I'm not going to kill him. And so David gets his water jug and his spear. And I like those final words, you know, in, the, in, that, in that passage. And let's go. You know, it's like, hey, hey we've, we've pushed our luck here. Okay, let's get out of here. And so they go, and he goes up to a high point above the camp. And he cries out. He yells out to the armies of Israel. And, uh, and he starts to have a go at Adma, Abner, the, the leader of the army. And he says this, what you have done is not good. As surely as the Lord lives, you and your men must die because you did not guard your master, the Lord's anointed. Look around you. Where are the king's spear and water jug that were near his head? So David is, uh, he's not mocking him, but he's just saying, listen, guys, you're doing a stink job. Yeah. We could have, we should have taken out King Saul. 
Abishai, my mad mate next to me, he said, just one thrust, that's all I need. I won't need to strike him twice. That's what Abishai reckoned. And so here we have David showing to Saul in absolutely black and white terms that he's not after his life. So why do you see me as your enemy? Why are you so offended by me? What have I truly done to hurt you? I've served in your armies. I've fought your enemies. You gave me your daughter to marry. I did that. Everything I have done, I've done to serve you. But the one thing that exists in this relationship is that you are envious of me. You are disappointed that you are not me. You are angry that other people like you. Is there not enough like or love to go around for both of us? Surely there is. But you want to have it all, Saul. And at life, life doesn't work that way. And here I am, the young fellow, the boy, probably it's still a teenager, trying to show you, an older man, how to be a mature leader. And this all happens in this moment. And so what does Saul do? He says here. Then Saul said, I've sinned. Come back, David, my son, because you considered my life precious today. I will not try to harm you again. Surely I have acted like a fool and have been terribly wrong. Then Saul said to David, may you be blessed, David, my son. You will do great things and surely triumph. So David went on his way and Saul returned home. And Saul returned home. You know, in our world, we are often privy to information. We are often privy to things that if we were to pull this out and reveal to others what it is that we know about somebody, we can totally undo their lives. You know, it's, a, it's the sort of thing where you, you find yourself in a position of privilege, in a position of power, in a position where all of a sudden everything falls in your lap and you're given an opportunity there to totally discredit somebody. That power is not opportunity. Okay, that power is not opportunity. What you've got to do is censor yourself in such a way that when you say, hey, look, it's my responsibility now to protect the reputation of people who may well have done something wrong in the past. But from that position of power, that position of influence, it's up to you to go to them and say, hey, listen, this is what I understand you have done. Is there anything still in your life that looks like that? No? Great. How can we move on from here? It's, the, the world works in a completely opposite spirit to that, doesn't it? We want to scandalize other people's lives. We want to put them in a position where they are, are seen to be inferior, just so that you can maintain your superiority. One of the craziest things in this last six weeks has been the, 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 the debate about the all-black coach, as they say on the media, the second most important position in the country after the prime minister. And, uh, and uh, I, I'm, I'm really close friends with uh, the coach's brother, Peter. Peter Foster's a, a Baptist pastor. And, um, and so, you know, every week I've been ringing Peter and going, hey, man, how's, how's it going? How's your family holding up? You know, the, the, the amount of stories that are being spread, everybody trying to, to pull this guy down just because they lost a few games. And, uh, you know, you'd think the world had come to an end, you know? I know when the All Blacks lose, it's bad, but it's not quite that bad. Almost, but not quite that bad. And yet, the thing that Peter told me, which really disappointed me to hear, was he says, you would not believe the lies. You would not believe the lies that are being put out in the media about who said what and why it was said. And you just come back to that place where you realize that these guys aren't about media. They're about selling newspapers. And, uh, and all of a sudden, you just put everything back in its right perspective. So what did David learn? What did David learn from his experience? Well, the interesting thing here is that we see the story. It says, so David went on his way and Saul returned home. What goes on? Well, I think David, uh, David took his no offense policy and he acted upon it wisely at the very end after having these confrontations with Saul, which put Saul in a place to say, hey, listen, Saul, don't, I'm not going to be the one who takes your head off in the middle of the night. This is what happens. This follows immediately after those last scriptures. It says, but David thought to himself, and this is always helpful when you think, one of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is escape to the land of the Philistines. 
Then Saul will give up searching for me anywhere in Israel, and I will slip out of his hand. Now, he's a guy who's been bitten a couple of times. And is he going to forgive Saul? Yes, we've proven that he forgives him. Is he going to forget? Heck no. Don't be an idiot. You're allowed to forgive. We're called to forgive. Don't forget. Don't put yourself in a position where you're going to be subject to that same thing again. That would just be dumb, wouldn't it? And so David says, I'm going to live in the enemy's camp, essentially. I'm going to go to the land of the Philistines because there Saul can't take an army over the border because that would be an aggressive act of war and he'd be fighting all the Philistines. But David and his bunch of men, they essentially go out there and they just hang out. They just hang out and they do their thing and they wait on God to do his. They wait on God to do his. And the story unfolds. Sad story for Saul. He goes into battle one day against the Philistines and he and his sons are killed in battle. And uh, at the end of the day, exactly what David said would happen. One day when God is finished with this guy, God will finish him. And then his time would come. Folks, we live in a world where the success of others can be a real, um, a real, a real stumbling stone to us. We live in a world socially, social, social media driven where the success and the best of what people bring is always on display. Yeah. We find that there are influences, uh, taking pictures in front of pictures that make them look like they're somewhere else when they're not really there. You know, we find people uh, photoshopping their images so that they look better than they are. You know, they, they couldn't pay our team enough to do that for me. But um, we, you know, the who you are and what you look like is incredibly important to people. And yet we can be sucked into the, the, the antithesis of this because we know people are out there grooming themselves, trying to look the best that they can. We can think it's our responsibility to knock and to mock and to pull them down. That's not our responsibility. The question is, what would Jesus do? And we've got to ask that even when we're on our keyboards, even when we're looking at somebody whose offenses have fallen in our lap. We ask that question, what does grace look like? What does love look like? What does mercy look like? And even to the point of saying, what does celebration look like? When somebody who you're really surprised by has done really well, you should be the first one to say, give them a high five and say, man, God has blessed you. Isn't that exciting? You know, it's absolutely wonderful that you would be in that place and not to despise or demean what it is that other people have achieved. Then at that point, we're demonstrating that we are the people of God. Why? Because our confidence comes from who we are in Christ. Our confidence comes from being a child of God, not the amount that we accumulate, not the amount in which uh, people would speak well about us on social media or any other other occasion. Our confidence has to be firmly established in God. Otherwise, we are always going to be subject to the, the wind shifts and the wave shifts of what other people think about us or write about us or say about us. And, uh, and that just makes us incredibly vulnerable. And we end up being like a Saul. Saul's biggest problem, Saul's biggest issue, is that he didn't know who he was. He was the king, but he didn't know who he was at the very core of his being. That's what made him so vulnerable. That's what made him so angry. And that's what made him so vulnerable to being offended. We're called to be people of Christ. We're called to be people who understand that we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. We understand that we have been bought at a price when Christ shed his own blood for us. That in itself, that powerful, powerful image of the cross where Christ is crucified is a demonstration of God's love for us, and there is nothing more powerful than that. That's where your identity, that's where my identity rests. That's where we become offense-free. Yeah. Let's stand for prayer. Oh, Lord, we know uh, how easy it is to be a spear chucker. Um, spear chucker is, uh, is within all of our capacity. And, uh, and maybe some of us feel like we've uh, had the finger put upon us because we know that that's our default setting. And so, Lord, we, we just ask you to, to identify that in us, help us. 
help us to, to recognize that we're vulnerable. Um, we, we, we push back with anger or cynicism or sarcasm. And, uh, and yet really, Lord, there are times when we just need to stop and pause and, and say, hey, look, maybe there's some truth in this. What is it that's going on? Lord, help us to have that depth of honesty about ourselves. But at the same time, Lord, help us to be people of celebration, to recognize that there are people around us who are going to be faster, stronger, brainier, more talented, wealthier, uh, more well-known. The world is filled with these people, and, uh, and yet we still have a right to stand on our own two feet and be counted. And we take that as a privilege given to us by you. Uh, we don't have to battle the battle of the world. We don't have to have more hits than somebody else. We don't have to have our, our, our face and our identity trending in social media because we know who we are. We're your children. And we thank you for David. Thank you for David's example to us. Uh, a remarkable response for one who is so young. But clearly his identity was in who you have made him to be. And he didn't need to prove himself any other way. And so, Lord, as we look at the series of offenses, yeah, may we see David, may we see Saul, and may we find ourselves somewhere in that, in, in that space and say, where are we, Lord? What are we doing? So, Lord, we, we give ourselves to you today, and we just ask that you would, you would help us to be the people of God who know with absolute assurity who we are. And so we ask this in Jesus' name.